Hello again, and welcome to the Master's Voice. I am Celestial, and you are welcome to this channel. To old and new subscribers alike, you are very welcome. I continue in the series that the Lord has finally decided to bring to the forefront. I explained in the first video that I received a prophecy on the 5th of January, 2021, concerning false prophets and the fact that those who are in the church deceiving the church of Jesus Christ, leading them astray and putting them in a very compromising position that could lead to loss of life will be taken away by the judgment of death. The Lord, however, has been speaking about these things to me since 2014. And even though the material in the 2014 prophecy is not going to be published on the blog, because those are my very private journal entries, I did share that when the Lord first started to speak about many of these big names to me, I was in awe. And I'm not talking about the kind of awe where we say that something is amazing and good. I was in a form of terrified all that the Lord would be speaking about people who are rightly or wrongly viewed as fathers of the faith for this modern generation. These people are most of them seen as pillars of Christianity. I was in a form of terrified awe that the Lord would speak to someone who was just studying at the time and start to say such strong words about these people. And since the day that I brought for forth part one of this prophecy, I've had to go through tons and tons and tons of notes looking for what the Lord said. And I finally found it. It was on January January 17, 2014. And when I finally pu published the original word, I will include aspects of what the Lord said, not in that written prophecy, but I will speak about it when I do the video. However, very early this morning, this is pre-dawn hours, the Lord started speaking to me with these words, not unto death. The title of today's prophecy is called not unto death the false ones will fall. So if anything, I would say that this is part three because the January, January, um, 5th, 2021 prophecy is part one. That is the first time that I would say in recent memory, God crystallized very strong words about false prophets, about the deception that they bring to the church, about the harm that they cause the church and how God says that for this, the judgment is total removal. This is removal from your place. But in case of some of them, this is removal from life altogether. In fact, when I found the old prophecy from 2014, I actually saw that, um, that one of, one of the people that God was speaking about at that time, who was still alive, very well-known man, and that will come later in the video, if the Lord permits, has already passed away. And it was a catastrophic type of passing away. But today's prophecy is talking about people that the Lord says are under judgment, but the judgment is not unto death. So not unto death is a phrase that you can find from um, the prophet Isaiah talking to King Hezekiah and telling him, God has said um, that you will be judged and your judgment is unto death. This means that there is a judgment that is not unto death. You can get sick in the Bible, it says it, but the sickness was not unto death. King Hezekiah was given a judgment unto death. And yet he cried out to the Lord in such a perfect picture of repentance that the Lord sent Isaiah back before Isaiah had even left the palace and told him, go back and tell that man that I have seen his tears. I've heard his cries. And I've also been touched by his genuine heart of repentance. And therefore I will give him 15 more years to his life. Not unto death, the false ones will fall June the 30th, 2022. Before I read this word, I have a few things from the Lord that he gave me just before I started this message. Please understand that this, these are very heavy topics. So I've, I've said, I've been here for almost two years now and the blog is over three years old, but I've always said that I find it curious that people crave YouTube notoriety. Um, they don't see it as an invasion of privacy, most people. In fact, they can't wait to put the camera on and start talking about things and to have people love them and follow them. But if you watch all my old videos up to now, I have always said 
that you don't come to the master's voice to follow celestial. This is not a cult of one. This is not a cult of popularity. I'm not winning anyone to myself. I am a Christian walking in the true way of the Lord Jesus Christ. I am planting my footsteps exactly where my Lord and master is planting his footsteps and telling me for you, young lady, put your feet here and follow where I step. And so what you are watching is me living out my calling before you all. This is not a place where I am amassing likes or followers or anything like that. I understand that these things are necessary to keep the channel going, but you need to have it in your mind that the things I'm talking about are reflective on our faith as a collective. And so I take these things extremely seriously. I came up in a time and under pastors who taught the proper word of God. And one of the things that I was taught it is, it is sad when generals fall. It is not a thing that this modern generation does that, I knew it, it's a confirmation, I knew that so and so. In fact, God has placed in my heart a healthy fear of picking up a rock of any kind and throwing it at a true called person. There is even one person in these messages, when his name came up, I was asking, Lord, is this name to be included in today's prophecy? And the Lord said to me so plainly, I do not say that you should speak about that. God's demeanor is so holy, powerful, and so worthy of reverence that it is necessary for me to check every single thing multiple times before it comes out of my mouth. So the first thing that the Lord said today, and I will be reading some scriptures, is that God said that he will take away true prophets from the land. I spoke about this in the last video concerning prophecy, and the Lord reiterated it just before I started. He said, I will take away the true prophets from the land. And then hear this, he says, whether that prophet is just the grandmother who's speaking truth to her daughter and her daughter's children, or whether it is a father who is rightly shaping his household, or whether it is a true pastor or a true prophet who is speaking, I will take them away. So there's a lot of misconceptions concerning prophecy, especially here in the United States, because there's so much polluted doctrine here in America. Everybody believes that they are prophet. Everybody believes that if they have a dream or if they have reached the point in their Christianity where the Lord is sharing counsel with them, it's called sharing fellowship with the Lord, and the Lord is revealing things to them, then they automatically said, oh, I'm a prophet too, I'm a prophet too. But if I can just flatly say this, true prophets in this earth are harder to find than teeth in the mouths of chickens. When the Lord shows me these people, I have absolutely no doubt that they are no doubt persecuted and very lonely because as they appear in the earth, you can't even find two of them close enough together to be friends. There's not even two of them living close enough together to build up a relationship and say, please encourage me because this is happening to me in my ministry. They are so few, so far, and so rare. And when the stiff wind of Antichrist rises up, this is when we will know that true apostleship, true pastorship, true prophecy is rare because all the false ones will flee. And that's in one of the visions that is very well detailed on the blog, and I think it's called the five, Ministers of the Five, where the Lord showed me that in the final times, when the rubber hits the road and Satan stands up and begins to actually take life out of the Christian church, please pay attention. When Satan actually begins to take names and pull people out of the book of life and begin to attack God's true messengers. And those people begin to get cut up to pieces for they shall be in some cases cut up to pieces for the things that they have said and done and prophesied. They're going to follow the early apostles in like manner of death. That is when you will see everyone who is a prophet now 
will melt away. Everyone who is a pastor will flee away. I saw them running as the demonic onslaught began to hit the earth. They abandoned the wall and ran away. And Satan was able to crush huge holes in the wall. Why? Because the so-called pastors, the prophets, the apostles that have 13 titles now were gone. They turned their back. They fled and they left the wall unattended and people were dying as a result of it. So there's this mindset that prophecy is very common. It's everywhere. Everybody, there, there's nothing like that. And we will go through it in the prophecy. God said that even the woman whose mouth is so anointed, the grandmother who has invested all her life in his word. She's a type of prophet and she's trying to talk to her daughter and trying to disciple her daughter's children, but her daughter does not want to allow her access to really raise these grandchildren. And her daughter doesn't even want to allow that grandmother access to touch the daughter's heart, to, to instruct the daughter and her husband or the husband and his wife, the son and his wife in the true things of what God says. God says, and this message is as old as I think 2019 on my Facebook, that he will take these modern day prophets. They're not real prophets in the office, but their mouth is as the word of God to whoever will listen. He even says that fathers who are trying to rightly shape their families, a father, the man in the home has the right to shape both wife and children. There are a lot of wives who don't know that your husband does have the right, especially if he's a godly man and he's an example to shape your faith. But the sorrow of modern marriage is that many men do not know, they don't know God. So they, they have zero shaping ability. They want to shape the family in their own image, in the image of their own ego, but they don't know how to shape Christ in their wife and children. But God said that the, some men know how to rightly shape their household. He says that even these men will be taken away. Fathers who cover the home are going to be taken away. There are righteous men in the home who are married to wrong women. They're married to women who do not submit to their authority and who do not actually see that with this man, God has covered them from the, from the boulders that can actually hit a woman in this life. God says he will take away the grandmother and he will take away the father who's shaping the home and he will take away true pastors and he will take away true prophets. And he said that he will bring a famine of the bread of the word. They will go without me. They will have little to feed them. People are going to be starving for the true word of God. Not every true prophet and every true pastor is going to be taken away through being actually removed from the earth. A lot of the true people who speak the word of God are simply going to be told to stand down. God is going to tell them to stand down. And because the reason for that is because people hate the true word of God. People actually hate true prophecy for true prophecy is not a butter knife. True prophecy is the good quality Japanese one that can shave bone and fat in seconds. And people don't like the feeling of that. And so the Lord says that they hate him and they hate his word. And he's going to take their word away, his word away. When God takes away the word, we become naked and exposed to whatever Satan wants to do. So I just, wanted to let us know this is what the Lord says. And he says in one way, it is judgment, it is punishment. And that's because people hate to hear the truth. In another way, he says, it is training. Now, when the true word of God is taken away, it, it refers to something that King David said in the book of Psalms, where he says, I have quieted myself like a weaned child. We know that when babies are born, as soon as they're hungry, they cry. They fuss when they're hungry. And then if you don't bring the food soon enough, there's screaming that comes after. But a weaned child that you've broken off the breast and now put on the bottle and now trained to know there's feeding times. We're not going to have you eating every second of the day. There's feeding times for you, little one. The Bible says that the picture of the weaned child is a person who has learned to be still. That is all it is. The weaned child, the weaned Christian is the Christian who no longer needs to constantly go to, to concerts, to constantly go to conferences. Basically, they're Christians who are full of adrenaline rush. They constantly need some kind of excitement, some kind of release. Something has to be happening. Someone needs to be talking to them all the time. They need confirmation all the time. They cannot simply read the Bible 
and be still. So God says he will take away the voice of truth because it will be like a detox for Christianity after years of programming, after years of sitting at 20 minute intervals and 30 minute um, gospel programs with your favorite pastor and your favorite um, um, singing band, God says he's gonna take away all the truth so that Christians can simply learn how to be still, read the Bible and have that be enough for them. This means that in your prayer time, practically, please listen, it may mean that you may go longer and longer periods before God says a word to you. And what God is expecting to see out of you is not an emotional crash, not God, where's your voice? What happened to our sweet fellowship in the garden? You're not talking to me anymore. What happened, Father? God is instead looking to see that you can simply wake up and read your Bible and be consistent. And then one day he'll say something and you'll be like, Lord, and he will say, but I was here all along. When you are a mature Christian, you don't need to hear God talking to you anyway, every day. And I know people will look and say, that's easy enough for you to say, but my case is different for obvious reasons. And so here's the prophetic word. Now that I've said all the things that I've said, please understand that as I'm reading out the names of these people, it is not for personal vindication or anything like that. It is because, and let me go to Jeremiah chapter one and verse 17. When the Lord called me, this was one of the chapters that I had to read over and over again. And verse 17 says, therefore prepare yourself and arise and speak to them all that I command you. Do not be dismayed before their faces, lest I dismay you before their faces. This is the new King James. The original King James says, do not be confounded before their faces, or I will confound you before them. And God was telling I, uh, Jeremiah very clearly at the beginning of his ministry, young man, you have a choice. I'm going to put words in your mouth and you are to speak all the words you're not to swallow the difficult words, Jeremiah. You're not to cut them off of the broadcast because you know how the people in the city are. You are to speak every word that I command you and do not be weak or shaky as you stand before them. Because if you do that, if you compromise the word, I will shake you in front of them. So, the choices are prophesy true and stand firm or prophesy to please the masses and I will strike you down. If you've seen even two videos on this channel, I'm sure you know which choice I've made. Not unto death, the false ones will fall. June the 30th, 2022. The banner scripture is this. This is going to be a lengthy video, so please watch it in parts or do whatever you need to do to get through it. Thus says the Lord of hosts, do not listen to the words of the false prophets who prophesy to you. They teach you vanity, emptiness, falsity, and futility. These three words, emptiness, falsity, and futility just means worthlessness to the fullest degree. They fill you with vain hopes, they speak a vision out of their own minds that does not come from the mouth of the Lord. They are continually saying to those who despise me and who despise the word of the Lord, the Lord has said, you will have peace. And they say to everyone who is walking stubbornly after his own mind and his own heart, no evil shall come upon you. This is Jeremiah 23 verses 16 to 17. Please make sure that you read Ezekiel 13 and make sure that you read Jeremiah 7, Jeremiah 8, and Jeremiah 23. Those chapters give very good insights into how God feels about false prophecy. So God is saying, don't listen to the people who are talking to you and prophesying to you and telling you that only good things and good years are ahead of you. They are filling you with pointless hope. They're filling you with worthlessness that is not going to help you. And they're constantly teaching people who despise me and despise my word. And this is what I said in the beginning of the video, that God says he will take away his word because people actually hate the true word of prophecy. They hate the true word of evangelism. They hate the true teachings of biblical principles by good pastors who are challenging them to come out of the pig trough clean themselves and begin to eat at the table with a knife and fork as the Lord wants. 
So he says, don't listen to them because they're teaching you worthlessness and they're promising you false things. And they're actually making you more stubborn in your mind and your heart by telling you that nothing bad will happen to you if you continue following after the way they're showing you. And so very early this morning, definitely pre-dawn, God started to speak to me about certain people. And in some cases, he just gave a single sentence. I had to then go and do a little bit of work before, a little bit of research before I could understand what God was saying and why he was saying this. God wants us to mark the false ones among us and to depart from them. Should you hear these people's names and you decide you don't want to depart, that's your choice. But God says that deception is nearly impossible to diagnose in some cases. So deception cannot occur between two things that look opposite. You cannot be deceived by the color of my prayer shawl and the color of my shirt, even a child knows the difference. Deception only takes place where two things are not easy to tell apart. Deception occurs when two things look and sound so alike that you cannot discern between them without spiritual help. False will mix with the true, just like yeast mixes with bread and puffs up the bread. As yeast makes dough rise, it weakens the bread and puffs it up. Yeast is leaven, and spiritual leaven will kill the true faith of Jesus Christ in a person. So if you're somebody who loves leaven, then you're going to rise. You're constantly going to be this happy Christian who, when others are telling you that judgments are coming, you're going to say things like, God will never do that. You're going to say, God will make a way. You will say, not my Jesus. And that's because you're flying high on these mountain heights of glory and false joy and expectation that any minute God is going to come and pull you out of the word, world and take you to a place of wonderful promise. But it is because these false workers, prophets, pastors, and teachers have flooded the church of Jesus Christ and started to teach people how, how to follow after the gospel of another Jesus. And Apostle Paul said, he warned about this, and he said, if anyone comes to preach to you another Jesus other than the Jesus we have taught, so the Jesus of Paul is the Jesus that requires us to endure until the end. The Jesus of Paul is the one who motivated Paul to say that we who are alive and remain, pointing to a time period where some people are not going to be alive and remaining and others are still going to be favored by God or chosen by God to hold on. That's Paul's Jesus. But the Jesus of today is constantly promising wonderful things. And those wonderful things come out of the false prophets because of the false desires that are in the hearts of people. So when you are stuck in a certain doctrine and it's in your heart, the person you love the most is the person who puts on the video and records messages that exactly speak to that desire in your heart. You won't like the person who constantly goes against what your desire is. And so you look online seeking for those who confirm your existing bias. But the Lord says, that these people are enticed and led astray by their own desires because they have no love of the truth. Now in Bible times, God didn't tolerate falsehood in prophets or the people. God will not overlook false prophecy or spare the ones who love it or the ones who do it. There was always judgment in the Bible, such as Elijah's fiery showdown with the 450 prophets of Baal. But in today's world, the false prophets are fully reaping the benefits of a deceived and automated social media world. You can sit at home and say literally anything and say, Jesus told you. And because people have no discernment and because they do not know how to test the spirits, whatever they hear that confirms the bias within them is taken as the true word of God. And so here are these people. Some of them have become corrupted over time. They were true ministers of God. They were called, but then fame, money, applause, and the need for affirmation has made them forget who called them. Also the lust for spiritual power. And I spoke about this kind of spiritual power in the first video, talking about how pastors go to various 
realms and dimensions of the spirit realm to consort with entities, demons, creatures. All of them, of course, are just different ranks under the overlord, Satan himself. They do this for underworld power that does not come from God, and it makes them turn their back on God, and they fall away to what the Bible calls perdition. Perdition is a state where when you enter into it, there's no coming back from it for you. You're stuck there, and you're going to end up getting the judgment from it. And the Lord was showing me that some of these people, they cross over fully to the dark side, so they don't want to have anything to do with Christianity anymore. But a lot of them are kept in the Christian space by the devil because they are such good tears. They weaken the church by teaching a watered-down gospel. Some of them are openly or hiddenly in witchcraft, and the church cannot discern it at all. And so they're working on earth, but the Lord says that in office, these original ones have all, in heaven, these ones have already been stripped of office, and they are simply trading on a famous name. But many others are brand new mushrooms. So they're shiny new pennies that have just popped up in the last five to 10 years because of social media, which makes it easy to do so. The first word that the Lord said is Merle Haggard is a false teacher. He is not a Christian. So when I first heard this Merle thing, I thought that it was a woman. I thought it was a woman. And in the written prophecy, please read it. I will link it below. In the written prophecy, I have shared the process of everything that I heard and how I, how I understood what the Lord gave me and how I'm bringing it out. So when the Lord said Merle, I thought, isn't Merle a woman's name? And I left it because I had to write down everything that he said. But afterwards, I went and I looked up Merle Haggard and I found that Merle Haggard was a man, a country Western singer who came from a very tough background. He sang a lot about a wild lifestyle, about getting tough breaks, about liquor and women and things like that. And I truly wondered as I was reading different articles quickly about this man's life, what a country Western singer had to do with false teaching. But after much looking, I began to find that near the end of Mr. Haggard's life, he got cancer and he began to add God more and more and more into his conversations. He seemed to be softening towards Christianity. But the Lord said to me that this man was not saved. He says, America loves a convert, even if the person doesn't actually get born again and convert. So the religious community of America welcomed this man into the gospel con circuit simply because he would use the word God here and there. And he began to go around to churches to give concerts, and he was constantly being pushed as a converted son, a person who was born again. All this man's songs basically said along the line of, I want to be good, but really I keep choosing the bad. But he was put forward, him and his songs, as part of the We All Need a Little Grace school of evangelism. And the Lord says that this man did not die in the faith. And that is all. The next thing he said is Jesse Duplantis is a comedian. Such people have been installed to distract the body of Christ from my requirements of holiness, godliness, and righteous instruction in the ways of God. Without these things, no one will see God. People are kept comfortable and familiar right up to the day of their death in such churches, and after which they will rise to face a judgment that they are not prepared for. So Jesse Duplantis is a comedian, and God says that this type of person is deliberately planted in the body of Christ to distract people from requirements of holiness and righteousness. And without holiness and righteousness, it's impossible to see God simply because if you do not actually get taught the truth of God's way, how to approach God and walk in his way, there's no way that you're going to die and rise to a well done, my good and faithful servant um, outcome from Jesus. And so the next person that the Lord said is Rick Warren runs a multi-million dollar corporation. It is not a church. It is a business. And while he accounts for its profits here on earth, he will account for millions of souls lost in the judgment. So, um, I think I won't exactly say the exact scripture because it doesn't come easily to mind, but there's the Bible says that, um, 
Yes, to whom much is given, much is required. Something like that. So if God gives you a very big platform in this life, God calls you to the ministry, God saves you, you start off well, you're running, you're running, you're running with all your strength, you're preaching the gospel, you're rebuking where you need to rebuke, you're edifying where you need to edify, you're building up where you need to build up. And God allows you to grow to these monstrous proportions that a lot of American churches have now reached over a 20 to 30 year period. And you turn the church into a business. It's all about keeping the seats full. It's all about making sure that the materials get printed on time, that, that large amounts of books and CDs and stuff is being sold. And yet the gospel is lost in it. God says that this type of person as Mr. Mr. Wick Warren is accounting for profits here on earth, but he will account for the millions of souls that he potentially could have won and planted good solid trees in the earth. He will account for those souls in the judgment. So remember, this is false people, but their judgment is not that they're going to be struck, not that they're going to die like the other ones God mentioned. The next person that the Lord spoke of is this. He said, Kenneth Copeland is a false apostate. That is all God said. So the rest is me then adding and teaching what apostasy is so that if somebody, somebody doesn't understand it, they can understand it. An apostate is someone who has been fully trained in God's laws, God's ways. Please listen, most importantly, who God is. So God is not his laws and God is not his ways. God is a person. But an apostate is someone who is trained in all three key aspects of our father, his laws, his ways, and who he is. An apostate can never be a weak Christian, backsliding Christian, a baby believer. So if you're having struggles in your faith, God is not calling you apostate. You're simply backsliding or struggling. Baby Christians, weak Christians, backsliding Christians are people who don't even have the full knowledge of God yet enough to establish their faith. They're still struggling to establish their faith and to be seen as a mature believer. An apostate is always someone who is a fully matured believer with full understanding of God's laws, God's ways, and who God is. Someone who has been fully introduced to God. They've seen his miracles and his hand at work. They've sat directly hearing from the Lord who he is and what he's about. Then they turn around at some point and they begin to deny God in their actions, their words, and their lifestyle. So apostates are people who have met God and been with God for a while. The proof of God has been seen in their life and the fruit that comes from these people has once been tasty, good, and true. But then they begin to pursue words, actions, lifestyle that deny God. Some of them even go so far as to say, there is no God, but others stay in their sheepskin because it gives them an opportunity to sharpen their teeth on the sheep. The Bible says that it is impossible to bring such people back from this fallen state. They will stay that way until they die and until they get judged. For it is impossible for those who were once enlightened and who have tasted the heavenly gift and become partakers of the Holy Spirit they have tasted that good word of God and the powers of the age to come. If they fall away, to renew them again to repentance, since they crucify again for themselves the Son of God and they put him to an open shame. In other words, it's impossible for somebody who personally knew God, God enlightened you, he revealed himself to you, God opened up his chest I'm sure many of you have heard me say that, that God can be vulnerable to us and open up his chest and show us what is really going on in his heart, in his mind, the things that he takes seriously. God does this with a person and then what the person does is turn around and deny God by how they live. If you fall away, there's nothing you can do to make such people repent because to do that, to bring such people back means that you will have to crucify Jesus a second time and God will never allow that. The next name is this. Tony Evans is a brotherhood member, a false pastor representing another gospel skillfully woven into the real one. It is impossible detect, to detect even if you know what to look for, for he has been teaching the gospel too long to make mistakes. His children are not part of what he does. He crossed over alone. He is with the Masons. He wears the 
And the sentence stopped there, and I saw a strange cross. It is a cross that looks like this. It has curvy sides, and I found the closest thing, I hope it will be visible, the closest thing that I could find was that. But the image that I saw was a metal, a, a metal pendant that he either has or wears as a symbol of his affiliation. Masons means Freemasons. The Lord says that this man is of the same order as T.D. Jakes. I have seen some of this man's messages. I have read some of his books and his name has never been shown to me by the Lord until this day that he is false. Therefore, understand that there is a level of falsehood that is not rooted in how this person teaches the word of God. You will not hear them stumbling in how they present the gospel message. The Lord is concerned and the Lord reveals these things because the roots of the teacher, pastor, preacher, prophet, apostle themselves is corrupted. So sometimes with God, his concern is not that there is fault with the material on the plate. There are a lot of false teachers. They're easy to catch out because they don't know A from B from Z. And you can just listen to two sermons and just know that this person is just having Wheaties and then talking about the Wheaties that he ate, but he's not rightly parsing the word of God. But there are people who put forward the word of God in a pristine fashion, but God is not concerned with what is on the plate. God is concerned with the person who is offering the plate. The next person is Jennifer LeClaire. Jennifer LeClaire is a witch, a full-on Satan-observing bibliophile. She has misled people with the books she writes because she pretends to be of the kingdom of God while promoting another gospel. She is loyal to the beast and not to the Lord Jesus Christ, serving another Jesus who is an actual entity they serve in the satanic kingdom. This other Jesus is either brown haired or blonde haired and is a physical entity that exists in the satanic kingdom. Please understand that to those of you who don't take your Bible seriously, you don't really read it, you don't really spend time with it, people in the satanic kingdom take the Bible so seriously because there's a ton of stuff that they can use from the Bible to raise up effigies in their kingdom that will have power. When Apostle Paul is talking about don't follow after another Jesus, trust and believe that there is an actual physical entity in the kingdom of the devil called another Jesus, a demonic entity and personage, a bibliophile. The word confused me when the Lord said it because I am one of those. It's a person who loves books, words, and the use of language. But God explained that by the love of books, words, and the use of phrases, which this woman is very good at, she has deceived the church. I've never read a book from this woman or heard a sermon or message, but I know that she is a prolific writer from checking up this morning. She is a prolific writer and has quite a few books on how to be a prophet, how to activate your prophecy, how to open your prophecy eye, who is a prophet, and things like that. Always remember that there are levels of deception. It is not always about what is being written in the books, but it is about who is writing the books. She is not a prophet ordained or called by Jesus Christ. Witchcraft is a means of spiritual power whereby by manipulating in the dark world. So this is works and deeds done in the dark world. People's minds can be controlled and be led to believe in whatever the one doing the witchcraft wants them to believe. Witchcraft is one of the most prevalent weapons being used by Satan inside the very walls of churches around the world today. Witchcraft, false teaching, and demonic music the unholy trinity that is causing the church to stumble and fall down in the last days. The next thing the Lord said is that California churches are largely corrupted. They promote what the Bible calls doctrines of demons instead of the true teachings of the Lord Jesus Christ. Lord says, repent, California, you as a whole, the whole state, or I will come and take your crown from you. Floods, earthquakes, and civil war in the streets will come to you because you abandoned the Lord your God and you continue to do wickedness. The next thing is this, Bill Johnson is a false prophet and has corrupted the entire body that serves with him. 
All of them are purveyors of truth mixed with lies. First word that you should note is that a purveyor is someone who's selling something. To purvey means to be a shopkeeper, a shop owner, and you have goods for sale. So God says that they're selling the truth mixed with lies. Bill Johnson is the founder and leader of the world famous Bethel Church in Redding, California. I have never heard a Bill Johnson message or read any of his books, but I am aware that there are plenty of them, especially on prophecy. This church also has a Bible school, bringing up tons of young people who eat up every word that is said there and share it with other young people. It also has a lot of grown people sitting there and believing a lot of stuff that they should not. The root of it is corruption that destroys everything it touches. Think of the defiled plate. It's either the food is defiled itself or the server is defiled. The next thing is this. The Elijah list is contaminated. It is full of well-meaning false prophecy. Stay away from the feeding trough. So I, here are my notes. I discovered the Elijah list in early 2000s. At the time, my one and only thought was, and remains, who ever heard of this many prophecies gathered in one place by so many people? It can never be. It can never ever be the Lord speaking in chaos like this. This is an American thing. And this thing has continued. This idea that a whole bunch of people can just get together and just have a dream, have a vision, have a this and that, and just pile it all together and say, this is all prophecy. This is all true prophecy. There, from the beginning of the Bible to the end of the Bible, such a thing has never existed. For prophecy is the voice of God to a messenger, that the messenger goes forth and cries forth a message. And the message is different to each messenger. God if, if the messenger is like a cell phone with a privacy lock, then God is the thumbprint that unlocks that messenger, speaks his message to that messenger, and then says, show the phone to the people and let them read the text messages that I am sending through you. The idea that you can have a compendium of prophecy, untested, unknown, untried, endless groups of people, you don't know what the root of their faith is. You don't know who the root of the dreams, messages, thoughts, ideas that they are having coming into one group and then prevent presenting it and saying, this too is prophecy. This thing baffled my mind when I first found out about it, but I thought nothing of it until the Lord brought it up. And since the early 2000s, this is a long time ago. Um, so the Lord says, um, it is corruption because you can never tell what is false, what is rooted in di divination, and what's just a bellyful. A bellyful is just when people have Bible study and they have their feelings and they believe that God is speaking to them, and he might be, or it just literally might be a bellyful. And they write it out, and then they say that God said it. Reading such things rips the protective netting away from the mind of the reader. And eventually, when you read a lot of it, it will cast you into confusion and delusion. These other names were given to me. Chris Valaton, Valoton, Lance Walnow, Kat Kerr, Frederick Price, now deceased. Kim Clement, now deceased. Now about this man, this last man, the Lord has been talking to me about him for quite a few years. And the Lord says that this last man, Mr. Kim Clement, now deceased, and deceased very early in his life, to those of you who may know him, says this man became lifted up in his heart, pulled by the praises of men. He began to employ theatrics for emphasis and depart from the way of the Lord, and for this the Lord took him. And I saw what the Lord sometimes shows me when he is showing me that a person is coming off track and is in danger of harm from the Lord. I saw this image of the thing we call a unicycle. It's a single wheel bicycle 
and it only has a seat. It, it has a pole and it has the wheel here and then it just has a seat. A unicycle is extremely hard to ride. It's not a bicycle. It doesn't have two, two wheels and it doesn't have um, handlebars. And basically a bicycle is very much easier to manage than a unicycle. A unicycle is only meant to seat one person and it takes incredible skill to first be able to balance upright on the unicycle and then be able to cycle it so that it moves forward without throwing you forward, tossing you backward. Now, when I see this unicycle for this man who is now deceased very early in his life, Kim Clement, there is a groove or a track that a minister of God, when God calls you to the ministry, when God wakes you up at three o'clock in the morning or comes upon you like boiling hot lava, whatever your origin story is, if you are a true minister of God, every single one called to stand in a ministry office has a, an origin story. You will know that there is a track set out for your life already. God prepares that track, pastor, prophet, teacher, evangelist, it doesn't matter. Your track is prepared for you ahead of time. Nobody asks you if you want to ride in that track. God will not ask you, are you comfortable here, celestial? Are you comfortable here, so-and-so? Does the track feel like something you can handle? When God calls you, your unicycle goes into that track. So there may be other people in the body of Christ who are also gifted, also skilled. God has set the gifts in the body, the members in the body, how it pleases him. And if you read, I think it's 1 Corinthians chapter 12, there are many ministry gifts there that the Bible says, these gifts are by the operation of the spirit. So a person who is not in the prophetic office can flow in what is called the gift of prophecy. But when you are in the office of prophet, you don't flow in the gift. You are the gift. This is Ephesians chapter four and verse 12, where it says he himself, speaking of Jesus, gave gifts to the body, some apostles, some prophets, and so the scripture goes. So you're not flowing in the gift of prophesying now and then. You yourself, your living physical self, are the gift that God has taken and given to the church to edify the church, to build up the body, to shave off the fat, to take people away from the dirty water that they seem to love drinking and to exhort them, to preach to them strongly until they feel something snap in them. The cords of sin begin breaking off and they begin to come up from this bent, mind-controlled posture that sin and lies puts people in and they begin to stand up. On that unicycle, you must ride your track. All the people in the Bible who decided not to ride their track died. Samson, Saul, there are too many of them. In fact, if you read the book of Judges, you'll be shocked at how short their terms were. And I thought to myself, Lord, either you called these men in their 90s and then they ruled for four years and they died, or you called them in their 20s and 30s and then their unicycle started going all over the place because of idolatry. And then you took them and simply chose a new judge. And so I saw this man's unicycle come completely out of the track. And that's what I saw. The next person the Lord spoke of, and he is in an old prophecy that is linked on the blog, Miles Monroe was not false, but he departed from the ever living God. And for this, the Lord took him. He disdained the holy ordinances and God struck him. And the prophecy that this is in is called cornucopia, profanity. It's a very graphic prophecy, so be sure when you go to read it that you know what you expect to see there. It showed the hidden sins of ministers of the gospel, God showing me basically the backsides and the sexual sins of pastors, what they do in the church, what they do upon God's altar. And here I took a piece from that prophecy that speaks of Minister Miles Monroe. In this ministry, everything is recorded. The date is on it. Every word is as I received it. And so I can always refer back to it in another prophecy as a witness. I saw another throne that was empty, but the minister had not sinned in this way. This is after describing other people's sexual indiscretions in the church. I saw the Lord had 
love for this man. But his cause of death was this, and it's a direct quote. He grasped the horns of the altar incorrectly and was struck for this. This man was Miles Monroe. There was the light shining on his throne as if to say, in memoriam, and his presence had also departed out of the heart of the throne. All the thrones I saw had a heart, a living or a dead presence. The thrones of the fornicators, whether they were white thrones or different colors like red or green or navy blue, navy blue were rotten. But Miles Monroe's throne was its Miles Monroe's throne was backlit and perfect and hushed and still like a garden. So let me explain this. The Lord showed me a vision of thrones, thrones in blue, thrones in gold, thrones in red and navy and different colors, even some of the thrones in white. Upon these thrones sat ministers of the gospel in various attitudes of fornication. I saw them receiving all sorts of different types of sex that I'm not going to relive at this time. And each throne had a presence in it. So whether the minister was actually sitting on the throne that God had given them and committing a sin at that time, or whether there was no one on the throne, there was a human presence in it. Mr. Miles Monroe's chair, his presence was gone. It was like a, a, a breath had been sucked out of the throne and the throne was now sitting there lifeless, but with a beautiful light from heaven shining on the throne and the aura around Mr. Monroe's throne was of a special place. Like when you set up a place to remember your mom and you go there and you keep it clean and you fix the flowers and you made sure that you got her a good spot where there's always sunlight, that is the aura around this man's throne and God really loved this man. But the image that also has shown of this man is his unicycle began to lean. So if this is the track and you are meant to ride the wheel of your unicycle, just like a train ball bearing only within the track, Mr. Monroe's unicycle began to lean in danger of jumping completely off the track and to prevent the loss of this man's eternal soul and the excellent work that he did do for God. The Lord said that he took this man. So these are the names that were given to me. The tares in the wheat of the Lord, but their judgment is not unto death, meaning that God will not yet strike these people for sin. It is possible for the Lord to give a judgment that is not unto death, and the person repents and the person can be brought back into the fold. Some of these people will lose their ministry publicly. They, God is going to shame them. God is going to do different things to make sure that they don't end up losing their heavenly reward and they don't end up losing their life. But then it's possible for you to be leaning on your unicycle and to continue pedaling at full speed, thinking that you're doing great or thinking that you're fooling someone. And for that, the Lord was telling me that celestial judgment is progressive. The Bible teaches that God says he will judge all things at the time. So when people come here and say, oh, no, you're too judgmental, I, I don't even pay any attention to you because you probably haven't even peeled the sticker off your Bible yet, much less taken off the plastic to actually read and understand what it says. Judgment is progressive, meaning that it takes many years to build up to where God is not going to bear with a certain person or a certain attitude or a certain city anymore. Jonah didn't just wake up one day and go to Nineveh and then the people said, Jonah, you're, you're too judgmental. When God sends a message and you're looking at the messenger and trying to quarrel with the messenger, it literally shows that you are operating at the lowest possible level of understanding of spiritual truths because there's no power in a human being's mouth to say, oh, this person shall exit life and then it happens. But if the human being's life is actually plugged to a speaker that is upstairs and that human being is speaking out and playing a record that is coming from upstairs, then when you see the fulfillment of the songs, sad, difficult, and painful though they may be, that is coming out of the record player, you will ask yourself, why did I quarrel with the record player instead of going to fall at the feet 
of the God who wrote the songs. And so the Lord was saying that it is very dangerous to aspire to the calling of ministry. The call of ministry is apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, teacher, Ephesians 4 and 11. These offices, as I said in the beginning, are very infrequent. They are not as frequent as they appear. They are not as easily found floating around as people think, especially the apostolic office and the prophetic office, because these two offices are recorded in scripture as the very foundation of the church that Jesus left here to strengthen the body and prepare it. So when you see apostle this, bishop this, and prophets multiplying like rain flying around in a monsoon storm, then if you are wise, you will understand that something is wrong. If you are wise, you will have to admit to yourself that all is not well in the state of Denmark, that somebody has to be lying because even in scripture, there were not that many of these people. That's why each one of them gets a whole book because they're not as frequent then and they will be as rare as hen's teeth now as we get to the end of time. But nowadays, people think that prophecy is bullseye. So when you say something and then it happens, it means you're a prophet. You say something and then it happens, you're a prophet. And yet, Apostle Paul was in a certain city walking around with a demon-possessed girl that was accurately prophesying who Paul was, who had sent him, and who the God that Paul was serving. Three accurate bullseye descriptions coming from either a demon or a fallen angel. And Paul did not care about the food that was on the plate. He turned around and he rebuked the source of the prophecy. And the Bible says in Acts chapter 16, verses 16 to 18, that the demon came out of the girl and then what? Her masters were angry. Why? Because they could no longer make any more money off the girl and her false prophecies. So to those who are still operating at the, the, I can only call it the basement level of discernment, where you think that a person is a prophet when they can basically read you three Bible verses that line up with whatever you dreamt about last night, and then that's prophecy, or they can tell you a thing here and a thing there, and then it happens, and it's bullseye, accurate, so they have to be a prophet. Satan... Satan is taking away people's lives and taking away people's children with the harm that causes harm. Now you might think, what does what the harm that causes harm have to do with anything, Celestial? Satan has just revealed one of his deceptions for the end times, just, just one, just a sneak preview. And many of you right now are watching your family members weaken and sicken in preparation to leave and exit this life earlier than they should have. You see, their unicycle, it jumped off the track. And now you're carrying pain that you can hardly stand watching them. And then you're desperately trying to fight for your niece or your nephew and tell your sister or your brother, don't do it. A grandparent, you're trying to get your grandkids not to have it. Satan is reaping the earth with the harm that causes harm because people have no ability to spot the lie. They literally cannot tell the wheat from the tares. And this is just the beginning. When you have falsehood in you, you are as light as a feather in the kingdom of God. A bunny rabbit could come in the end times and tell you that I am Methuselah risen from the grave. And you'll be like, you know, Methu, you look a little smaller than I thought. And you'll believe it. False prophecy creates holes in your armor through which spiritual darkness enters you. And when these winds begin to blow and the waves begin to beat upon that this house that we call earth, there will be literally nothing 
in those of you who consistently insist on consuming lies, falsehood, deceit. The Lord Jesus loves his church and he loves the ministers that he sent to reap his harvest. Therefore, when these people become rusted, corrupted, and spoiled, it is a terrible thing. It is a loss to the body of Christ. And it is a victory for the devil. Additionally, when the church becomes pierced by wolves, people that Jesus never said to go out and to set themselves up at lamp as lamps, when they are not lamps, they only want to take souls to darkness. Then we can understand why Paul said, the sign of the end is a very great falling away. When you are deceived, you are captured in your mind and it takes next to nothing to make you fall away. There is a false light shining in the church today and that light has blinded men to the true light and the true gospel of Jesus Christ. That false light has come up like the floodlights in a stadium, like a powerful second sun, burning the retinas of Christians who think that they are in the way but they are not in the way of Yah. They are busy following after and serving another Jesus. Thank you for visiting the Master's Voice. I am Celestial. Thank you for watching this video. Thank you if you are a subscriber to this channel. Thank you if you are a supporter of my labor in the vineyard of the Lord. And until I see you again, God bless you and goodbye.